We have David Siskovic, uh, who, who's now out in Seattle after a distinguished career here. We also had David Kleinbaum, who, who uh, later was a colleague of mine at Emory. So we had all these Davids. Uh, so so I, uh, I uh, focused on what was going on within the clinic, uh, the process of care, blood pressure control, and the, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the process of care and dropping out of care. And just to, to sort of be very brief about this, part of this work, what we found was the differences in, uh, by race and exposure to, to pharmacotherapy, to, to higher step level pharmacotherapy, seemed to be associated with the racial variation in blood pressure outcome, where in particular, uh, black males had the worst, uh, uh, had the highest blood pressure levels in the clinic, they had the lowest uh, a, a level of uh, pharmacotherapy prescribed, and, and, they, and they had the, over time, they had the, the least improvement in their, in their blood pressure levels. So this was some er very early work uh, related to uh, healthcare process and outcomes of care in, 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 in the uh, world today that we refer to as uh, <coughs> health disparity, uh, health disparities, uh, uh, health care disparities. Uh, I just, before meeting here, this, has anyone here worked with uh, Giselle Corby Smith? So, Giselle, I was fortunate to be K Award mentor for her at Emory University uh, earlier in her career, and I know she's doing just fabulous stuff, and including still doing work in Edgewood County, North Carolina. So, so this was, uh, this was some, some really. Uh, uh, the important early work that, that, that I had the opportunity to pursue through mentorship from Ed Wagner and, and many others. So I went to the Mayo Clinic in 1983, and so you know why did I go there? And I, there was actually an opportunity to stay here. In the, in, in, do we have any any uh, uh, physicians here? Uh, do, do anyone is trained at UNC? Yeah. So. You know, I, I had the opportunity to match in the internal medicine program here, which is absolutely phenomenal. But I, I decided that, that I, I, you know, I went on this really cold day in Rochester, Minnesota, spent a couple of days at the Mayo Clinic, and I was just incredibly impressed with the intensity of the Mayo Clinic's focus on care. And I thought, you know, this is really where I need to go to be, to be trained as an internist. And so I, I went to Mayo. Uh, in 1983, finished my medicine training in 86. So, uh, and, and this is just sort of a, you know, kind of a, a call out for, you know, those of you who have the opportunity to interact with patients, have, have clinical care experiences, you know, the observations you have can be incredibly important uh, in, in terms of, of identifying research questions that need to be addressed. So, I was a medicine resident and all of a sudden, we had a new head of vascular surgery. And I noticed that, like, I have a patient with a 4.2 centimeter intrarenal abdominal aneurysm on, on the hospital service I was on. All of a sudden, the patient, after a CT scan, would be whisked off to, to, to surgery for, for elective vascular surgery. So I sort of scratched my head and I said, oh, okay. So, so, so maybe there's actually some literature on this. So I go to, you know, Cecil's textbook of medicine, Harris's te Harrison's textbook of medicine, very surgical textbooks, and I realize basically there's completely lousy study designs that relate to uh, wh why surgeons might do that. And, you know, in terms of shoe leather, shoe leather epidemiology, no one had even done the basics, the population-based study of risk of rupture for aortic aneurysms, much less a randomized trial. So, this led me to, uh, a couple of years later, after I finished my medicine training, I was, uh, I was the PI of what was then known as the Rochester Coronary Heart Disease Project. Uh, in, in, in part, I was in that position because of great mentoring from people like, uh, like Al Tarroller and Ed Wagner. So I sort of said, so what, what are the benefits and risks of electively resecting small uh, uh, inferior aortic aneurysms and at that time, roughly about 50,000 Americans were having this procedure each year. So this led to many, many papers on this topic. 
But the, the first one, so is, is, is anyone here in medical school? So, okay, so, so if you do end up in medical school, a great way to have a, a opportunities and to match is to be the first author on a New England Journal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Marty Nevick was a summer medical student with me. And uh, I said, Marty, I'm, I'm going to have you work on a project that's going to make you famous. And so, so Marty did a great job with this. Uh, and uh, uh, today he's a senior medical director at the FDA, an ophthalmologist, matched everything. And he could have gone anywhere in ophthalmology. He ended up deciding to train at Mayo. And so, so this paper uh, uh, ba basically uh, transformed thinking about the natural history of aortic aneurysms. Essentially, we estimated that the risk of rupture for aneurysms uh, less than five centimeters was about one tenth of what was, was uh, reported in the medical literature at that time in, in textbooks. And then subsequently, <coughs> a study from Scandinavia in the Lancet, a study from the Oxford Regional Health Authority uh, in the British Medical Journal had the same, essentially the same estimates that we had. So out of that, uh, I was, I became part of a group called the, uh, the RAND uh, uh, Academic Medical Center Consortium on Appropriateness of Care, uh, which was overall led by a guy named Bob Brook. So, so Bob, when he did his DRPH at Hopkins uh, in the early 70s, he had the temerity to focus his work on the quality of care at Hopkins ERs. And he put, I think, three of his papers in the New England Journal of Medicine from his DRPH. And Bob was mentored by Carl White, and many of you are probably familiar with the 1961 Ecology of Medical Care paper from UNC, authored by Carr and Bernie Greenberg and Frank Williams. So, so we, we, uh, we did this RAND panel, and out of that RAND panel, basically, we said there's this gray zone of appropriateness where um, basically about 70% of all the elective uh, aortic aneurysm surgery procedures are in that gray zone. Uh, a little bit about science and politics. So my colleague at Mayo, who's a really prominent person in vascular surgery, he knew this was going to come out. And so almost immediately before we released this, he had a position paper in the Journal of Vascular Surgery saying you have to electively resect any small aneurysm. Uh, what I will say is, after uh, many, many years of evidence, that person came back to me and said, you know, David, you were actually on the right side there, and I was on the wrong side of the evidence. But so, so this led to, to this academic medical center uh, uh, consortium work, and it also led to several randomized trials, uh, including one led by my late colleague, Frank Letterly, and, and I've done several Cochrane reviews on this topic, but, but basically, the randomized trials of, uh, uh, of elective surgery, immediate surgery versus watchful waiting for, for aneurysms four to five and a half centimeters that account for a large percentage of all intramural aneurysm surgery in this country. There, there, there's, no, there's no health, there's no uh, survival benefit. The costs are much greater uh, associated with the immediate surgery approach. And the work we did in the VA, we, we ran like 1,200 veterans, about 1,100 of them were men. And given the distribution of the general artery off of the aorta, uh, the, the only significant health effect we found was that men randomized to immediate surgery had a much higher risk of impotence compared to men who were in the watchful waiting room. So other work that I did at Mayo, uh, uh, we, we had a, a lot of interest in, in corporations and in, uh, in the cost of care. This is in the late 80s, early 90s. Through funding from the Hartford Foundation, they asked us to do a sort of benchmarking exercise to try to compare the cost of care for several corporations with care in Homestead County, Minnesota. And obviously, you know, we have a long, long discussion about the complexity of that and adequacy of risk adjustment. Some of the early work we did in these claims databases, we found men were having hysterectomies and women were having prostatectomies. And so we had to do some work you know, cleaning up the data. Uh, but, but we did this initial study, and then we did a study that compared Homestead County to another community 
uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And what we found was that the cost of care in Orange County, adjusting for everything we could adjust for, was about uh, a third lower than the cost of care in Cleveland, Ohio. This led to something called the Cleveland Health Quality Choice Initiative uh, uh, in, in the 1990s, as that community tried to focus on improving the value of health care. So uh, this paper was motiva motivated by uh, a release of hospital mortality data by Bill Roper. So uh, Bill at that time was the head of HICFA. And I think you know he wanted to sort of uh, move hospitals to, to uh, th think more seriously about improving patient safety. So our experience was um, the Mayo Clinic hospitals in Rochester, Minnesota, Methodist and St. Mary's, they had the lowest risk-adjusted mortality of any general hospitals in the U.S. Their observed to predict it was about 0.5. And so basically my colleagues at Mayo asked me, so David, you know, should we believe this? Uh, uh, do we really think that coming to our hospital compared to some other hospital truly reduces your risk of dying from a hospital episode of care by 50%? So I thought, no, probably not. Uh, most of this probably relates to referral selection bias, to unmeasured confounding in this claims model that you know, a Medicare beneficiary lives a thousand miles away from the Mayo Clinic who can fly there and receive care and has those financial assets, probably has a lower risk of dying, really, than someone who, who uh, is, is, shows up in the emergency room from the community. That'd be particularly the case, say, for someone undergoing a perhaps a, a hip fracture, a hip, hip replacement surgery, where maybe the person flying a thousand miles away to Rochester, Minnesota is a marathoner, and the person who falls and breaks her hip in the community is frail and elderly. So long story short, uh, I, I did this paper <coughs> which showed that almost all of the, uh, the uh, observed to expected mortality of 0.5 uh, departure from 1.0, the null value, was due to uh, 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 unmeasured confounding. But I was smart enough to select several other national referral centers to the med med MedPAR data showed the same thing. The Mayo Clinical Practice Committee actually voted on whether or not we could submit this paper for publication. Because there were people at Mayo who said, you know, this, this isn't good news for us. Why should we put this out in the literature? Much to his credit, Dennis Cortese, who was chair of the Clinical Practice Committee, uh, who went on to, to become the CEO at Mayo, said, you know, the world expects us to do this sort of thing at Mayo, and, and, and we, we need to identify uh, this issue. Bob Brook, who I mentioned earlier, uh, used to teach in his Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars class using this as an example of what he thought was one of the most courageous papers ever published in health services research. I was sort of referring to this as a paper that could be the terminal publication of one's career. <laughs> so I, I had the good fortune when I went to Charlottesville, Virginia to lead the Carl White Institute in, in China. I'm looking at the time, so I'll be brief. So I, I was there, uh, $1,000 in the bank, no receivables. UVA said, David, connect us to this clinical information systems company. Do good things for the university. Long story short, I recruited the world's five largest pharmaceutical companies. I recruited six of the state level quality improvement organizations, several universities. And over a 10-year period, we worked on trying to improve Medicare quality, open quality measurement, quality improvement methods from the Higher Rubin 1991 JAMA paper saying basically physician review of medical records is a really poor way to classify quality to evidence-based measures of care. So we did a whole lot of work. Uh, some of you who's worked, you probably know Harlan Krumholtz was involved with this very early on. Uh, we also did work very early related to uh, the, this problem of the increasing cost of cancer care. I had a uh, uh, with the American Cancer Society. We had a whole issue of the journal Cancer devoted to purchasing oncologic services. Those papers are still relevant today. But I was always guided by, by, by Carr's uh, big picture. So those who can't read in the back, have a little statistical compassion and take a look at the quantitative information before providing inadequate care or wasting millions of dollars. 
so, so, so Carr was a, was a tremendous mentor for me during my time in Charlottesville. And those of you who have not yet read the Ecology of Medical Care paper, you need to read that. That predated the, the ACO world by, by like 50 years or so. Uh, and, and it's a still, a still a very important paper about the importance of a primary care foundation in healthcare. So I was uh, recruited in 98-99 in to go to Dallas to become the chief quality officer of what became the largest healthcare system in Texas, about 11 billion in annual operating revenue, about 50,000 employees, 1,100 clinical practice sites. <clears throat> a typical day for me was kind of getting up at five in the morning, driving four or five hours and visiting three or four of our hospitals and visiting with some, some local community <coughs> leaders and ended up back at home at about midnight. So I had the chance to, to, uh, to design uh, from scratch the approach to quality improvement there. Uh, I, uh, I had an interesting discussion with our, uh, our CEO about uh, how transparent we wanted to be because as those of you who've looked at Cross and Quality Chasm, one of the 10 simple rules for a 20, high performing 21st healthcare system is uh, that, that uh, transparency is necessary. So our lawyer didn't want me to put our performance data uh, 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 out anywhere where anyone could see it outside of these, these sort of closed meetings. Uh, and people would you know, pick up all these quality reports at the end of the meeting and shred to shred them, put them through a shredder. Um, so, but I was able to convince our CEO that, well, this is really, this is really going to be research because we're going to put it into peer-reviewed literature. So I basically took our first system level quality report and published it in, a, uh, in, in the International Journal of Quality and Healthcare in 2003. Amongst other things, uh, so uh, my early work, I showed our performance. I was there for a year. I had data on core measure performance, preventive service performance. We were getting these things done about 50% of the time. Uh, ACE inhibitors for people with heart failure, beta blockers for, for, for people with MI. And, and we were getting preventive services done about 50% of the time, mammography, colorectal screening. So I showed a slide, because Mayo had used those same instruments and had used their preventive service. So Mayo at that time was about at 85% on those, and we were at 50%. So I showed a slide showing our preventive service data, our hospital data, Baylor Healthcare System, Mayo Clinic. And so after that board retreat, one of my colleagues, the Chief Information Officer, says, David, if you ever show another slide like that, you're going to be fired. Uh, and I said, well, you know, actually what I'm going to do is create a burning platform to help people improve care. And so long story short, uh, we, we actually improved our preventive service delivery from 50% to 93% by 2007. And Tom Kotke, who's also a graduate of the School of Public Health, uh, wrote the editorial in this journal uh, 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 describing the, 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 the journey that we followed that he suggested others may wish to emulate. So I, I know we're getting close to 4.30, so I'm going to sort of wrap up here. Uh, amongst the other things I did, I did a lot of work related to electronic health record implementation evaluation. Uh, this particular paper in health services research is the one that won the John Eisenberg Award. So what else I did was, uh, so around 2012, we were thinking of merging with Baylor, with Scott Moyne Health. So I was thinking, well, you know, we've had a decade more of journey here in improvement. We're thinking of this merger. Why don't I put a book together that helps us to communicate with our merger partner, but also helps us communicate with the world about what we're doing. So in September 2013, uh, this, this first book was uh, published. And then, uh, so this first book came out, uh, uh, won a shingle award, but some people who read it said, you know, David, this is fairly, it's fairly conceptual. There are some examples, but we need a how-to guide. And so, so in November 2014, I published a how-to guide uh, for hospitals and trying. And both of these uh, books won shingle awards for their contribution to uh, uh, excellence. And, and th there's, th there are a lot of words here, but you know, if, if I think about my career, Brett James was at Intermountain in 1992 as the first chief quality officer in the United States. 
I came in 99 at Baylor Healthcare System as the second chief quality officer in the United States. And you know to have uh, to have Brent write this about my you know my, my book, uh, you know he, he, he sort of sum it up says those seeking to move to the safety of a higher ground in an increasingly difficult healthcare delivery world will find this book valuable beyond compare. Uh, and, and so you know I, I think uh, sometimes we we ask the question does anyone care you know why should I write this paper is anyone going to be interested in my observations. And I, there are so many uh, people who, uh, in healthcare who have read this book, who thank me for writing it. Uh, uh, it and so we're, we're wrapping up here right at 4.30. I want to, <laughs> want to thank a lot of folks. I want to, want to thank uh, uh, David uh, Strogatz for nominating me for this award. I want to thank uh, Till and the, the uh, selection committee. Obviously, I've talked about a lot of the great mentors I had here um, early on. Uh, all folks connected with epidemiology, Jean Mayer, who was the head of the AHEP program, uh, Sam Putnam, who was Sherman James, did some of the early work on doctor-patient relationships in healthcare, uh, with, with a guy named uh, Dr. Stiles from the, the uh, uh, psychology department here, and then uh, Ed Wagner, who was, who was my mentor. Sherman James was actually, Ed had moved to group health, Sherman James actually was the person who, who signed off, I think, on my my, my uh, master's thesis papers. Uh, Barbara Holko was very important in that work. Uh, and certainly uh, Al Tyroller. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I, and I, I think this, uh, this School of Public Health is really the reason why I decided on my eight, uh, after my 18th birthday of being offered the Moorhead, I, I knew that UNC had a great health science center, but particularly it had a great school of public health at that time. And so 17 of, of my, uh, 17 folks in my class at Lawrenceville were admitted to Harvard. I was the one who decided not to go. I decided to take the Moorhead instead. And that was the right decision in 1974. Uh, and it's it's really wonderful to be back here today with you to talk a little bit about my career. And you know, I, I'd love over time if uh, you know if you have questions about uh, you know my experiences or if I can be a resource for you. I I, uh, I regularly connect with uh, with students, and uh, I'm fortunate my wife has been uh, uh, has joined me in helping to fund the scholarship for students in the School of Medicine to do work here in the School of Public Health. So. So, uh, so I, I haven't done a lot of work in that space specifically. I've worked in gynecologic oncology in the past. Um, so uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, you know, what's out there in terms of say shared decision making? Can you go ahead. And work, work, work. I don't know if there are many tools. A lot of the guidelines from the professional work that they've been kind of squishy. Some work with respect to shared decision making tools. I don't know that that literature specifically, but I, I would I would try to look at that literature. Uh, I think appropriateness of care is it's very complex. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you know if you look at the healthcare cost problem in this country, only a very small part of that cost problem relates to inappropriate care. The, the largest cost problem relates to unnecessary care. It's not inappropriate, not clearly inappropriate, but it is unnecessary. Uh, it, and, and certainly if you look at, for example, like the work of accountable care organizations, 
uh, as you align physicians and, and hospitals uh, around uh, shared performance risk, you're seeing folks ask a whole lot of questions about what aspects of care that they thought were fundamental to good care or actually necessary care. Um, you have, you've said thank you for speaking, um, and speaking about your career, your interests, and your um, passions. You said earlier in your life that you wanted to lead a health care system. Yeah. And you succeeded in doing that. Yeah. 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 What is what's next? Like where do you think your expertise is now? Sure. So, uh, and, and I, I didn't want to talk about this next step just because I, I I work for a, a a public company right now, and there, there could be sensitivities about this. But actually, as I've shared with others over the last couple of days, what I'm doing now is intellectually the most interesting thing I've ever done in my life. So uh, I, about four or five years ago, a, a, the CEO of a company called Mentis started recruiting me, and I decided about 15 months ago to make the move. So this company is an endovascular simulation company, and so you know, a box like this with wires, catheters run through the box, and they simulate or emulate uh, uh, putting catheters into arteries. So for what are called endovascular interventions, pulling the blood clot out of your brain, putting a stent in your coronary artery, uh, 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 for symptomatic benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, 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 a prostatic artery embolization. So, so what, what I'm doing in this field is is there are huge potential opportunities to use endovascular simulation to reduce cost and reduce, reduce harm in healthcare. It turns out that a lot of this evidence still needs to be generated. There is some evidence in the literature, but, but the effects, the potential opportunities out there are huge, like in one example. Uh, there's about two million endovascular procedures done in the United States annually. In, Norway and Japan, about 96% are done radially. In the U.S., about 30% are done radially. Some places, it's less than 10%. I know in other environments, it might be close to 90%. It costs $3,600 less per case to do uh, uh, an, an endovascular intervention radially compared to femorally because of the decrease. Decreased risk of bleeding, decreased risk of complications, also better patient experience. So if you do the math nationally, you can save $3.6 billion annually across the U.S. just by moving from 30% radial to 80% radial. Uh, so so uh, I, what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to bring together a small group of healthcare systems to work on uh, uh, firstly, to create an endovascular intervention performance uh, dashboard that would have for these interventional procedures things like uh, procedure time, episode cost, measures of harm, patient outcome, uh, 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 patient experience uh, measures, uh, and employ an interventional physician, cath lab team, alignment, engagement, joy, and caregiving data. And so, so what, what we're working on is to create a dashboard so for like for example uh, 50 is probably there's 50 or plus endovascular procedures that are done regularly across University of North Carolina healthcare. Just imagine if for each of those 50 procedures you actually had at the hospital level, the physician level, information about procedure time, episode cost, uh, 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 patient experience, uh, caregiver experience, harm, uh, health outcomes. And so as one example, we know across the United States that for mechanical embolectomy for stroke, uh, that those times, certainly in day-to-day in, in, in -day clinical practice, vary as much as 15 minutes once the patient's on the table and ready to go for the, for the most efficient endovascular, uh, neurovascular radiologist to maybe two hours for some people. The difference between that could be someone being neurologically normal for the rest of their life versus someone having aphasia and hemiplegia for the rest of their life. So that's the kind of thing that, that I'm working on now, and, and that involves applying my background in economics and epidemiology and clinical medicine uh, 
in, in, in leadership, how, how, how to gauge these healthcare systems uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the, uh, the real challenges of you know, physician culture. Uh, 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 physicians, uh, uh, once you can get to the point of getting in meaningful performance data, physicians are competitive and they, they usually want to improve. But uh, getting to the point where, where healthcare systems and physicians are willing to have their performance measured uh, is, is, is what, what I'm trying to do specifically in the, in the basket. And now, unfortunately, I'm doing this globally. I was in Rome in early October, met with a place called Gemelli, uh, a part of Catholic University. They have just a fabulous performance management system there. And, and they're, they're very interested in the idea of bringing into that some of these other dimensions of performance specifically for their endovascular procedures. One more question. Yeah. So you had your second edition of the Steve book. Um, do you have a gauge about how many healthcare systems have, are adopting policies? Your blueprint in that second book? Sure. Um, so if you go on the internet, you, you find that a whole lot of healthcare systems are using this framework. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I could tell you exactly how many. Uh, so I, I would say on the order of you know a uh, hundred plus probably. And, and um, so so those six aims were articulated by the Institute of Medicine. You know my incremental contribution was a to bring them into an acronym that someone could remember, <laughs> but but b to actually show how you operationalize. Uh, uh, the pursuit of those aims across a very large healthcare system. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, as you can appreciate, I, uh, through the Steve Global Institute, while I was with Baylor Scott and my health, I did a lot of consulting with other healthcare systems to help them in their journey. Uh, and is UNC one? Uh, I, I, I've certainly had discussions with folks at UNC, <laughs> uh, and have, haven't, haven't had an explicit uh, role here. Uh, so my, my only real explicit quality role you're going to see was 1978 you know, <laughs> trying to develop this uh, appropriateness of peer admission tool. Yeah. <laughs>